Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. I'm Andrew Musgrove, joined by John Gibson. We're going to bring you the match preview, but it's going to be in a slightly different format because we're going to talk about Newcastle's fantastic 3-1 win over Aston Villa first and what we can take away from that into Saturday's game against Luton. John, welcome back to the podcast. I bet you're in high spirits after last night's victory for Newcastle United down at Villa Park. Oh, absolutely wonderful. I mean, we've pretty well transformed the season fingers crossed with back-to-back away wins that has been our achilles heel all season we went down to fulham in the cup and got through two nil wasn't a great performance but it was a great result and that's all that matters in the fa cup but the performance was there last night as well as the result at villa absolutely terrific i mean Aston Villa have set themselves up as the new us, haven't they? They're this season going to be what we were last season. Um, Except that uh, we beat them 5-1 up here on the first day of the season and 3-1 down there. So we've played them twice. We've got maximum points, eight goals scored, two conceded. Uh, Rather put in that place and I'm delighted about that. It was an absolutely top-of-the-range performance last night. I thought I was watching the old Newcastle. And even when we've won, I haven't said that too regularly recently because we've won sometimes without the performance. I honestly thought we had the performance last night. And let's not underestimate what we did because they have, they had the best home record in the Premier League. Um, Better than Liverpool, better than Man City, Man United, uh, Spurs, everyone. Uh, and we were travelling, having lost eight of the last 11, and with a shocking record at Villa Park. I mean, we haven't been able to even score a goal of recent times. So to come out convincing winners over the 90 minutes, and it was thoroughly deserved, uh, was a great fillet for us. And uh, you know what? I was off pleased for those supporters because they've been dealt a shocking hand with the time of the last two games. Seven o'clock on a Saturday night in London and 8.15 on a, on a midweek night in Birmingham is horrendous. No way of getting home. And did they deserve what they got? And I was thrilled for them as well as for myself, for Eddie Howe and the team. 100%. I mean, that was Villa's first defeat at home since February. So that shows you how good they've been doing at Villa Park. And it really is a fantastic win when you get into the numbers. You've mentioned Newcastle's poor away form, just their form in general of late. Then you look at Villa's home record. They're flying high in uh, the, the, the league going for the title. And Newcastle United have rocked up with some key players missing. Then you threw in the injury to Alexander Isak midway through the game, midway through the first half, wasn't it? Um, and you're looking at it and thinking, goodness me. And yet Newcastle still come out and pick up all three points. It really was a fantastic win for Newcastle. Oh, I, I mean, more than we could dare to hope for. Um, I was thrilled a bit and I was thrilled a bit with this performance we put on. We looked lively again. We closed down. We were inventive. And above all, what I liked was that we were tactically aware. Villa play a high line. We got the balls often diagonal over the back of their defence, attacked them with pace down both wings and, um, you know, really made them not know quite what was happening to them. Uh, We were tactically astute. It wasn't just a matter of hidden hope. Uh, And that was clever. And it nullified Villa the way that they've never been nullified at home in a year. So, you know, it was a... And there was some massive performances right across the park as well. Yeah, indeed. And we'll get into those names in a moment. But you are right about the the tactical awareness of Newcastle United. They'd clearly done their homework and it was the long balls over the top, which we haven't seen too much of Newcastle doing, even when they've been playing really well. The long ball game isn't really what they do, but it was clearly how it watched Newcastle, uh, watched Aston Villa, sorry, and said to his players, this is how you get the better of them. If you remember back in the summer when they win America, that's how they got the better of them back then as well. But it worked really well last night. Anthony Gordon, Alexander Isak, creating all kinds of issues when the ball went long. And what was missing really was just the, the kind of the, the, the final touch. There was a lovely ball over to Isak and it was inches from being brought down and he would have been through. Gordon had a couple of chances. 
but it was clear that Aston Villa were just shell shocked, and that was all down to the hard work and preparation of Eddie Howe and his staff. Yeah, uh, I mean, what made it feasible for us to play the way we did is the burning pace we have on both tram lines. You know, with Murphy on one side and uh, Gordon on the other side, then Al Mirren when he came on. We have great pace down there, great support from people like Trippier, of course. And in the first half, featuring very, very well was Lewis Miley, I felt, who ran from right to left in the channel, uh, giving support for Byrne to have an out ball or Gordon to have an out ball. He made that run behind the back wall time and time again and made himself available and they never picked him up. They, they didn't realise what was happening. Of course, they had the late flurry in the second half when they scored and might have got a, a second that was chalked off. The home team is always going to have that. And it was the subs coming on that, that made the difference for Villa. But we quietened that and, and saw it out in the end with absolute comfort. And I thought it was a joy to watch, even if the goal scorers weren't expected. I mean, what a fabulous centre forward Fabian Shaw's turned out to be. Who needs Isaac or Callum Wilson? <laughs> Indeed. Well, given their injuries, we might find Fabian Shaw up top against Luton on Saturday. Um, we'll get on to Shaw in a moment because, you know, we, we've had goal scoring centre backs before. We're thinking of Philip Albert uh, primarily, but Shaw just knows where the back of the net is. But I just wanted to talk about Lewis Miley first off, John. You just mentioned him there. Uh, this week, he signed a new long term deal with Newcastle United. And I imagine. That, Somewhere along the line, there'd been a conversation whether it'll been from maybe his parents, uh, maybe uh, you know an, an elder statesman in the dressing room, Eddie Howe, and just saying, "Look, you've signed the deal; it's public now, but don't don't get ahead of yourself. Keep yourself grounded." Well, the performance he put in last night shows that he's only got one thing on his mind, and that is performing well for Newcastle United because that first half, in particular, as you mentioned, the runs from Lewis Miley. Aston Villa just could not handle them, and it was a real key part in Newcastle's dominance, especially in that first 45. I mean, he's in a perfect situation, isn't he? Uh, he himself said when he signed the new deal, I've been brought up here, I'm part of the fabric. He's been there since he was an AI to a grasshopper. And, um, he, you know, he, he feels comfortable. He's got a manager that'll keep him grounded. He's got a family that'll keep him grounded. If you go away... Uh, and you're living by yourself if you've been transferred somewhere else in the country. You're living by yourself. You might not have the right manager that suits you. You can find yourself stuttering and spluttering. This is perfect for him. And he's getting so many opportunities. I think he's played, he started 15 of the last 16 fouls. I know it's because of midfield picks itself these days because we're, we're right down to the knuckles. But it's off giving him a chance. And he has taken that chance and taking it well. And, you know, Super Mac always said to me, because he was a great disciple of, of playing youngsters when he was manager at Fulham and he brought Paul Parker from nowhere to becoming, as early as Miley, to becoming a Manchester United and England international defender. Uh, but he always said they, that once you put kids in, they will do fabulous if they're talented. Then they'll hit a brick wall you just take them out for three or four games so they refresh themselves up, they don't become mentally stale, and then you put them back in. Miley, we haven't been able to do that with him, but he's not looked as if he's needed to do that with him either. He has managed to keep going, keep going, keep going. Very level-headed boy. What we would have done without him, when you consider the, the injuries that we've had in that particular department, goodness only knows... Um, and that has been a massive bonus. And I thought the, midf the midfield overall has worried me immensely of late because I think they've been all over the shop tactically, all over the shop when they don't have the ball. And a lot of teams have just ran through them. I thought they were much more organised and disciplined last night and got about that job much better than they've... This is a collective three, not talking of Miley in particular, and look back to the way we were when results were going our way. And hopefully that can happen again because our away form has been shocking. But, I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we've won at Sunderland in the FA Cup. We've won at Fulham in the FA Cup. We've now won at Aston Villa. Um, we all but won at Paris Saint-Germain when we were playing in Europe. We've got a good draw at AC Milan. 
were not the uh, little bunny rabbits in the headlight to wave more many more hopefully uh, nonetheless I'm delighted after two away games in what four days as I'm delighted to be back home this weekend we are now in a position because we've given ourselves a platform where we're still in the FA Cup as late as the fifth round with a decent draw away yet again sick to death of that but having said that you know Blackburn's nothing to be feared of especially when you can go to Villa and do that um, and and Sunderland are a better championship side than Blackburn so we've got a great chance there and in the league we've got the revival with the three games to come which is Luton at home, Forest away and Bournemouth at home that gives us a real chance to collect points before somebody jumps in and says I know all those three clubs have beaten you already this season true but that's the old jaded Newcastle. I'm hoping we're back to the normal Newcastle. John, you have a saying that usually you throw at me, and it's something along the lines of, you're going to have to tie me ankles to the uh, the chair legs because I'm yes. floating away with optimism. People watching and listening will be thinking, what has happened here? John Gibson is as high as a kite here. I'm loving it. It's infectious. Well, absolutely, because we we have never lost faith in what Newcastle can do we felt that the fates have been against us with injuries. The players have got as mentally tired as physically tired. That Howe's had his hands tied behind his back. I mean, how often do we say the same 11? And why do we say the same 11? Because there isn't an option. The only options are who's got, which youngster is going to come out of kindergarten early, leave school and sit on the bench for it. That's all we've had. And and it's been a bit of a difficult and a bit of a hard watch. And even when we won at Fulham, it was a it was a hard watch. But we I mean they could have played all day and they wouldn't score. But we looked here as if we were getting back. We looked against Manchester City for an hour in the last home game as though we were getting back. If we get back to what we can be, we're a very good side. I mean, Eddie used the word we looked like an elite side again at Villa Park and that was just about right and you know if we play the way we can play maybe Luton, Forest and Bournemouth have beaten us already this season but they won't do it again if we play the way we can they won't do it again in the next three and then after Arsenal we've got the cup so you know what lies immediately hopefully we've got through this sticky period we've got through the tough matches the Liverpools and the Man Cities in, in games like that. And, you know, now we've got a little bit of respite. Aston Villa was the last of the tough matches, although we made it look relatively comfortable. And But there's a real chance now. There's nine points on offer over the next three games. And then after Arsenal, a toughie, we've got the cup to get to the quarterfinals. And Blackburn away will do for me. If we've got to play away, I'll settle for Blackburn more than what we could have got away. Hmm. I'm loving it, John. I'm absolutely loving the optimism. It is great to hear. Just a final word on, on Lewis Miley. What what I, I really liked about Mother Than the, the runs he was making is his desire, want and ability to use his left foot as well. He's both footed and it's such an important asset when you are making those runs and he's so quick to get the ball into the box. We saw it a couple of times, especially in that first half. Um, and he's also, also signed that new deal as well. And what does the future hold for Lewis Miley? I mean, he just keeps on impressing and he just looks like he's just going to get better and better and better. And thankfully, John, in the black and white of Newcastle United. Yeah, it, 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 <clears throat> there's only two things that have got to happen with Lewis Miley. One is that he keeps his feet on the ground and I think he will unquestionably do that. Um, but there, there's always that situation. We're seeing it with Rashford at Manchester United at the moment. You know where you can get easily taken away and swayed away and all of a sudden your world evaporates if he keeps his feet on the ground and i thoroughly believe he will because of his parents and and because of his manager and because of his own nature i think he will and if he avoids bad injury and i'm not saying that because newcastle get a few injuries i'm talking about a serious injury uh, that affects your career, like takes away a yard of your pace. It happened to Michael Owen when he was a, a wonder kid and he was never quite the same player again. If he if he avoids those two things, his future is absolutely enormous. And hopefully, uh, unlike Waddle, Beardsley and Gascoigne, um, 
who were three Geordies Newcastle cashed in on. Hopefully, Lewis Miley's good years will be in black and white shirt. Fingers crossed. Another fantastic performance from Lewis Miley. You mentioned there, John, the victory over Fulham. It was not a good performance in the FA Cup. And I think the majority of people um, in the days afterwards said, great result, but the performance was, was, was below par. If you perform like that against Aston Villa, you're going to find yourself on the end of a defeat. Now, clearly, Eddie Howe was on the same uh, train of thought as well. And he's looked at it and he's gone, OK, we need to be better in every area of the field. And I tell you what, from the word go against Aston Villa, they were on a total another level to how they performed against Fulham, but also against uh, to, to Aston Villa as well, an elite side. And it was great to see the difference in the level of performances because clearly Eddie Howe saw what everyone else saw and realised that you cannot go into Villa Park in the same uh, the same vein of, of form. I think that's true. We must also, of course, give great credit to the players. Yeah. Because Eddie Howe can see it, but if they don't carry it out, it's all futile. And they did carry it out, and to a man, they rose to the occasion. And the worry was that we would be OK when, once we're playing one game a week. Um, because we get a bit of respite, we get a bit of rest. And then that's what horrified me against Fulham. We'd had a fortnight's rest, but it didn't look like it. I thought we looked leggy and lethargic, but we did the basics, stuck at it, and won comfortably in the end, but without the performance. Here, it was different. Um, tactically, we were very aware. We used the pace out wide. Um, we were terrific at the back. The land of jolly green giants. If they keep lobbing the ball in there, we can play all day. And Luton are terrific on aerial balls, and, and and that's their big thing is an aerial dominance. Well, when you're playing against Botman, when you're playing against a left back who's eight foot six, and two big strapping centre halves, and a goalkeeper who has got better quietly as time's gone on, and looks like the old Dipovka now, um. You know, we, we are in with a, a genuine chance of being able to handle that. Um, it was lovely to see Gordon have a spring in his step again, um, because what a good player he is. Uh, but he has run himself into ground, but he had a spring in his step again. Murphy, you must give all credit for the length of time he's been out. To start, you know, two matches like that in the space of four days, and he had to virtually go in both of them for an awful longer time than maybe was wished by the management team and um, because of the injury to Isaac at Villa Park. Uh, he's done terrific. He's very infectious. He's quick. He's got an infectious personality. I mean, if there was a dampener at Villa Park, it was Isaac getting injured. And you know what? Now, I mean, if a feather blows across the pitch, I'm terrified it'll touch one of our players because the to just go down in you don't know what's happened and they've got a bad injury now i'm not suggesting these axes but you, you're not pleased to see it and when it's a groin which he's had before etc etc but when he suddenly goes down in play has to stop and i'm suddenly saying good gracious i mean we haven't even got callum wilson match fit yet okay he might squeeze in against luton uh, in some shape or form but he's nowhere near being match fit so we can afford to in any way Isaac, all round, is a better player. All round. His, his ability on the ball, his quickness, uh, his touch. I mean, he, he's almost got the, the, the touch and the feel of a midfield player in a striker, whereas Callum Wilson's an out-and-out -out striker. Um, so, Isaac, well, I mean, Joe Linton's been a huge miss in that midfield, and Isaac would be a massive miss. I mean, I was even terrified, Andrew, when... Dubrovka went down a couple of times and needed treatment because it, it was during a spell where Villa were having the predictable flurry that all teams must have when they're behind, the death throws, if you like. He'd made a couple of very smart saves. He's come into his own with a couple of saves recently. Let us be truthful. I know people compare him to Pope and say he's second in the two-horse race, and I understand where they're coming from, but he's done a good job for Newcastle, believe you me, in this spell of having to sit in and survive bad results and um, but he's done well and when he that went down and we don't know because you know what eddie's like we won't even know on friday 
we don't know how bad, you know, he was feeling his groin. All of a sudden, he's not there on Saturday. And then he says, oh, well, he had a groin because he got done at Villa. Can you remember? And all of a sudden, we do remember. Now, I'm not scaremongering because I hope that both Isaac and Dubovka play on Saturday afternoon. But they worry you when you get players down like that because you also realise how thin the bench is, and because you think, who will replace Dubovka in goal? Who will replace Isaac at centre-forward? And you suddenly think, Nobody that would reassure you. Mm. No, I, I totally agree. And you no know, people who listen and watch this podcast will not have been bagging on since the summer about the need, not just for a third striker to come in and sit on the bench and come on half an hour ago, but a third striker who can rival Callum Wilson and Alexander Isaac Absolutely. now for that one place up top. Because unfortunately, as good as they are, they just are too injury prone. Now, Eddie Howe, said after the game he didn't think the injury was too serious and it doesn't look like it's going to affect what Newcastle are going to do in the window essentially uh you know the understanding is that the window is it's practically done now for Newcastle United absolutely yeah it did not affect the window but it could affect the team on Saturday <laughs> yeah and that's that's the issue you know okay they can't go out and spend a boatload of money but I do wonder whether another injury to Alexander Isaac even if he's just missing say the next game do Newcastle United actually go out in the summer and change maybe their transfer strategy and say, okay, yeah, we're going to need someone who can start the majority of games because right now, and I say it with such a heavy heart, the two players they've got, they're not uh, reliable enough to play the majority of games in a season. Especially and Wilson. Cast- yeah, especially exactly Wilson. As well, but especially Wilson. Um, and I mean, yes, obviously they ain't time to do anything about it in this transfer window. I mean, the door's almost shut and he, he, Eddie said, you know, I cannot get anybody in without getting somebody out. And Eddie doesn't want anybody out. He's so relieved that Al Mayron was there last night and come in and done a job. <clears throat> he wants Callum to stay, et cetera, et cetera. It's too late to do something about it now, but he must, they must do something about it in the summer. I mean, they really do need a centre forward. They really do need a six. We're not going to bang on about it too much. But, I mean, these things must be addressed. And we'll have had two underwhelming windows of things stay as they are. <clears throat> because we've had nobody this window. In the last window, yes, we didn't know what was going to happen with Tenali. Yes, we didn't know Barnes was going to have a long-term injury. But after that, we effectively bought two cover fullbacks. Reserve fullbacks, not first team fullbacks in Livermanco and all, and the the little winger who's on loan at Feyenoord. So there was nobody from last summer after having fabulous transfer windows since the takeover. The one last summer wasn't. It hasn't had a great impact on this season at all. And we've got nobody in this window, so we've got to get impact players for positions needed. Because I would suggest we didn't need to cover fullbacks. As great a player as Lev Hominko isn't going to be, we didn't need two cover fullbacks as much as we needed a centre forward or a number six. So we must get players in the right positions this summer and players who can hit the ground immediately running as Trippier did, as Bruno did, as Buckman when he got in did. Um, we need to do that. But that's for the summer. It's not for now. Given that the window looks like it is going to shut without any incomings, yeah. um, do you understand why that has happened, John? Because a lot of fans will be sitting there thinking, goodness me, we need a six, we need a striker, we need a, a right winger. But what Newcastle United have done is, I mean, they've showed, showed their hand publicly with the Downhills interview, um, and they've obviously cut their cloth accordingly to, to the constraints they're working in financially. Do you understand why they've not gone out and, and spent anyone pretty much because they can't? And does that reality of the situation, the want, the desire, the need to stick to the financial fair play rules and the RSP oh. rules, does that insulate kind of the negativity that might otherwise have spilled out, say, if this was a Mike Ashley window? You know, because if this was a Mike Ashley window, the the criticism and, and, and the, the, the fallout would be massive. But I do think the difference is, John, that fans... And journalists, they know it's a long-term project. They know that actually come the summer, they definitely will spend money. Whereas if it was under Mike Ashley, you were sitting here thinking, nothing in January. 
and I'll be very surprised if there's anything other than a, a cheap buy in the summer. But it's not like that this time around, is it? No, it isn't. It's far from that. Um, the financial fair play is an absolute bugbear to us. I mean, it really is a massive irritation. But I tell you what, we don't want to be Everton, return points deducted, who bought a boatload of players, you know, none of whom could play. And we don't want to be Nottingham Forest, who bought 43 players, most of them couldn't, couldn't play. We give them two. Um, and and they're fighting a relegation fight and they're being charged. And we don't even want to be Manchester City with 115 charges against them and might be relegated when their case is heard and by aren't they fighting behind the scenes to try to avoid that or drag it out for as long as possible. We do not want to be in that boat and therefore we've got to do what we do now and bite the bullet. There's no question. We don't want irresponsible ownership. Everton have had irresponsible ownership. Nottingham Forest have had irresponsible ownership. We don't need that. We've just come out of very bad ownership with Mike Ashley of a different sort. Not the overspending, the lack of spending, the lack of investment, the lack of care, the neglect, if you like. We don't want that again. It's hard to take. It's hard for fans to take. It's hard for me because I'm basically a fan as well as, as, as a hack. It's hard for you for the same reason. We want to see a, a centre forward. We want to see a six. In a depressed moment, we say, why haven't we got one? We need them. Um, but we've got to realise... And we do realise what the restrictions are. I mean, the only little thing that bothers me is that I can't get my head around why we tried, why we signed two fullbacks at about fifty or sixty million pound that obviously weren't going to be in the first team when we could have got a centre forward for that money or a six. <clears throat> I'm half glad we've got to live for Menko. I'm baffled about Hall. But anyway, let's not. We started off on a wonderful mood of optimism. Let's not get. Uh, you get ourselves pulled yeah. down but yes i mean <clears throat> if we can get people back now like harvey bonds is on the verge of being back <clears throat> callum wilson's supposed to be on the verge of being back if we can get these people back we're going to be without tonali we're going to be without joe linton uh, etc but if we can get a couple of guys back then we can get through now in the end of the season to the end of the season and who knows beat blackburn get a good home draw in the quarterfinals and we can be playing for a cup. Mm, well, we said that, didn't we, before the Fulham game, the importance of getting through. It's not just about Absolutely. getting through the next round. It's about kick-starting the season. It's hopefully done that. But yeah, definitely, just the knowledge that these owners are ambitious, they want to be at the top of the tree. It's a comfort blanket for what has been, in many ways, a disappointing window, but knowing that the summer will be something else and they will be making signings, they will be improving the, the, the squad, it makes it a little easier to deal with um, knowing that Newcastle haven't brought in and strengthened the positions that we think they should do, but knowing that they probably will do and and, and will do in, in, in the summer. So, But I also think, John, before we get back to the Aston Villa game, um, doing it the right way, would be so more satisfying than if there were no rules and you could just spend and spend and spend because with the owners Newcastle have got, if there was no restrictions on, on spending, you know, we'd probably be sitting at the top of the, the Premier League right now um, and, and looking for... Oh, that would be awful. Title. I hate that, Andrew. It, 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 would be awful. it would be, but my, my point being, I just think there'll be, there would be just a different kind of satisfaction to, to do it this way, to do it the hard way in many ways. Where, they, where there are rules and there are restrictions that you have to adhere to. And I just you know it's like people always say to I have this conversation in my family. Would you rather win the lottery? Or would you rather build a business up from scratch and sell that for millions of pounds? And I'm like, I'd rather win. I'd rather build a business and sell it rather than win the lottery. Everyone's like, you're crazy. And I'm like, well, no, because the satisfaction at the end of that will be so more than it you would be just winning the lottery. When you've waited... For as long as I've waited for a title, you're not my age yet, mate. I, get I would that. take it with I would take it with a, a ribbon round the neck tomorrow, and I would buy it if I had enough money to buy it. I would buy it for Newcastle. I don't care which way we win it, if as long as we win it. But that's just because I've waited too long. And quite frankly, I don't want to wait to do it the honourable way. I used to always talk to Kevin Keegan, you know, when he was manager at Newcastle. <laughs> he always wanted to win the championship, the top flight championship, 
with an all-out attacking side. You know, 4-3 results, etc., etc., the overlapping goalkeeper, all that sort of thing. That's the way he wanted to win the title. And, you know, he almost did. When he had a 12-point lead over Manchester United that season in the uh, mid-90s, he almost did. But he didn't. He didn't. And I want to win anyway. Any way we can, I want a trophy and then I want the league title. And I don't care if we buy it. Man City bought them all to start with. But yes, it, it, there is the perfect way. And the perfect way is that you build up to it with these restrictions and then you do it with an all-out attacking side. But who remembers perfection? What they remember is that little silver glint up on the top of the mantelpiece and that bus ride around the town. And I'm yearning for that. And... Um, We'll do it within the restrictions and we'll do it. And the only thing to concern ourselves with is the time factor. But, I mean, you know, I, if we won the FA Cup this season, I would be made up. I would be absolutely made up because the last time I saw that, 1955, I had short grey trousers on, socks up to my knees and a, a, a cap like today, only it was a school one. Um, and so to watch Newcastle win the FA Cup again, and we almost got the League Cup last season, would be absolutely fabulous. And that would turn this season from being a seesaw job into one to remember for the rest of your life. And uh, I'm not saying it'll happen, but it might. Why not? It, it definitely could happen. Definitely could. Let's let's be positive. And um, fingers crossed we're at Wembley come May. Um, Let's get back to the Villa game then and Fabian Cher, two goals for the centre-back. You know, he is f fantastic. He's just signed a, a new deal as well. Goal-scoring centre-back, but someone that can also put in a, a sliding challenge and clear the lines. He's Is he is he nearly the, the complete centre-back, John? Well, talent-wise, ability-wise, God's gift-wise, yes. I mean... He is a wonderful footballer. Forget about positions and just think of players as footballers. Who's a good footballer? Who's got a good touch? Who's got vision to clip a ball long and short? Who's got accuracy? Who can get in to finish? Who can do the slide and tackle to stop a goal? I always said that Peter Beardsley was one of the greatest all-round players I've ever seen because he had the midfield skills and the finishing skills. I'm not trying to say Fabian Shaw's that because he's not. But he is a wonderfully talented footballer who didn't believe enough in himself because the managers didn't put the belief in him before Eddie Howe arrived here. Eddie Howe's looked at him in training early doors when he come here, took him to one side and said, son, you're a player. You're for me. You'll be in my side. I'll buy players, but I won't buy players for your position. You'll be in my side. And I want you to have that confidence. I want you to come out the back with the ball and spray it because you can play and he can play. And um, it's been wonderful to see because he was one of the deadbeats along with Miggy and Joe Linton and uh, a host of other players who turned into decent performers and have blossomed the ugly duckling that's become the swan They've blossomed under Eddie Howe and then Shaw's done that and it's wonderful to see. And he is a danger in the opposing penalty area. He's terrific in our penalty area, but he's a danger in theirs. There's no question about that. It's funny because all the talk in the first kind of five, ten minutes of the game was about how Unai Emery had referenced Newcastle's threat from set pieces. And I have to be honest, when I heard that, I kind of... It, thought really like i don't know if i've just been stuck in a, a downward spiral but um hey i mean against villa the, the, the set pieces the corners were were the threat that unai Emery was worried about because that's where two of the goals came from and it was fabian share just being alert being clever and losing his man for the first one and then just being alert for the second one after to come back off the bar um right place right time but great finishes from from short range and just happy that Newcastle United have, have made the most of these set pieces. Yeah, I, th I think probably what Emery was talking about is when you, not so much the evidence of watching uh, videos of Newcastle matches, but thinking first and foremost of the accuracy of Trippier's delivery and then thinking, look at the big men that can put up there. 
you put Buckman in that penalty area, you put Shaw in the penalty area, you put Byrne in the penalty area, you put Isaac in the penalty area. They're all giants. They all tower above your defenders. You've got defending your goal. So we we ought to be a threat on set pieces, shouldn't we? With all those giants and the accuracy of Trippier in delivering the ball, we ought to be a threat. And sometimes, you know, I've thought we're not as great a threat as we should be with all those guys in the penalty area. But we were at Villa um, and they told, and it's going to be interesting on Saturday because their threat basically is from set pieces. Luton's threat is set piece threat. Uh, so, and but we've got the Giants to deal with that at the back as well. I mean, physically, we they have a set piece threat, no question. For example, they've gone to Everton twice this season and won twice, and all four goals have scored to beat Everton twice have been from set pieces. Now we can deal with set pieces when Burns playing left back, and he will against Luton again because he did well until they brought the new guy on and they put Lafamento in. That was clever as well, by the way. When the new guy come on, who was ripping with down the right hand side, they moved they moved Burn to to make it three centre backs and put Lafamento in there because Burn, who had done super, was suddenly getting torched by this for this trick we in pace, and and they did that, which was clever. But I mean, when you think against Luton's physicality in the air, etc., we ought to be able to deal with that with Byrne, Botman, and Shaw. The, the, we, have, we physically will be okay. What we've got to watch is we've got to stay switched on mentally so nobody runs off the we're, we're back and gets. You can have all the big guys in the world, but if you stand like Grey's Monument, the other team will score. You've got to make certain nobody's running off your back. And if we do that, we'll be okay. Mm, yeah, and you've got to make sure that Newcastle have the fight about them that was lacking the last time they faced Luton, but it's certainly been back in abundance against uh, the teams that played recently, and particularly against Aston Villa. They were they were up for the physical challenge, John, right from the word go. And you saw uh, Kamara getting very angry, um, some really needless fouls, but it was the physicality from Newcastle which drew those fouls out. Douglas Louise wasn't happy. And it was just great to see Newcastle United really bringing back all the elements that, that have made them great in the last year. So under Eddie Howe, you know, the fast-flowing football, the precision with the passing, and then that physical kind of nature of the play, especially in midfield. And Aston Villa, just they weren't up for the fight. They could not handle Newcastle United going, you know, into their faces and saying, if you want, you want to take us on, you take us on. And Newcastle won the physical battle, like I say, pretty much from the, from the word go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a very heartening, very heartening performance because it took me back to what we were. Um, and now we've got to follow that up. But we have give ourselves a platform. We've won two away games on the trot, so there's jinx of playing away uh, and getting swallowed because our only Premier League win away was that 8-0 freakish scoreline at Sheffield United. Um, but all of a sudden, we've banished that. We're still in the FA Cup with a good draw. Blackburn away is a good draw. You could have Liverpool, you could have Man City. Blackburn away is a good draw. <clears throat> and the three games we've got coming up now to cash in on and get claw some points back. If we do that, it begins to look rosy again. The only fly in the ointment, apart from the fact that the next three teams we've played has already beaten us, but doing it twice is a bit more difficult. The only flying ointment is what team goes out on Saturday. Is he, is Isaac in it? Is Dubrovka in it? I think Dubrovka will be in it, but we don't know. When you see him go down like that, you don't know what's happening behind the scenes. We've got no idea on Isaac, and we'll be given no idea, I would think, <coughs> until we get the team sheet. But if we can put out our normal side, normal for these days, I mean, uh, um, because of the injuries, you're not going to have Joe Linton, you're not going to have Pope, you're not going to have Joe Willock. Uh, if we can put out our normal side, we'll be okay. Mm. I think it'll be unchanged other than Isaac. I don't think we'll see Isaac um, on Saturday. So it just then rests on whether Callum Wilson is, is fit enough to feature. I think it might come a little bit early for him. So I think, unfortunately, you'll see Anthony Gordon up top with Miggy 
and Jacob Murphy on the wings. And I think that's detrimental to Newcastle because Gordon's so electric on, on the left. Although even when he's been on the pitch in recent games, he has switched to the centre and he's actually come out to the left. But I think Gordon's best position is out on, on the left. So to have him needing to fill in for Isaac and Wilson shows you exactly why Newcastle need to go out and get a, a third striker. Um, but just on the wings, John, we saw Jacob Murphy keep his place. Um, at right wing and winning plaudits. You've already praised him for coming in and playing loads of minutes, you know, despite Mooney coming back from injury recently. But he's just, he's very direct, isn't he? He's got pace yeah. about him. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, he got he got a, an own goal, let's say, because um, he's trying to put it back across the, the box and it's hit the defender and that defender's taken a whack to the groin. I mean, I'm not really sure that we needed TNT Sports to show seven different replays of the, the poor defender um, hitting the post at that angle because I think every gentleman felt it um, on the on the fifth or sixth replay. I was certainly watching between uh, between my fingers. But um, a word for Jacob Murphy, John, because he's another one who's just turned his career around under Eddie Howe. And if you'd asked people two and a half, three years ago whether Jacob Murphy, A, would have been a miss, having been out for however long he's been out for, but B be within a real shout of actually being a, a first team starter week in week out they would have laughed you out of Tyneside oh he he was just another name that was hanging about the subs bench he wasn't going to have any particularly good career at Newcastle he's become a valued member of the first team squad if not the first team itself um, from start he's very direct he's hugely infectious both in personality and in the way he plays the game. He plays the game with a smile on his face and he works very hard for the team. I mean, he is a massive, massive plus in coming back. I mean, yes, I don't like the idea too much of uh, Gordon, Murphy, Gordon centre forward and Murphy and Almiron because I don't, I think in terms of finishing, and yes, they can all three can finish, but they're not natural regular finishers. You wonder where the goals are going to come from. Whereas it so Isaac will be a massive loss because he's a quality finisher and a quality player. If he doesn't play, he's a major loss. What you're hoping is that you've got either Wilson or Harvey Barnes on the bench because he can finish coming in off the left-hand side, opening his body up and sticking it in the top corner. You're hoping that they might have a few minutes in them on the bench for cameo performances in the second half because that remains a problem. We don't have too many options for putting players on later on when legs start going. We've got plenty of options at the back, but we haven't got many options midfield or forward. Luckily, we had Miggy on the bench when when Isaac went, and, and therefore that didn't hurt us as much as it could have done. Um, but we don't have many options otherwise. So, I mean, Livermanco is the best option after that that can fill in emergency midfield or fill in emergency left winger, um, you know, if it's required. But, um, yeah, if we can get people back on the bench with it which is i mean dear old eddie you just don't know do you i mean harvey bonds has been getting closer for how long now i mean christmas is getting closer but it's still an awful long way off yeah you never know quite when somebody's going to come or not come yeah i think with those two callum wilson and harvey bonds the last thing anyhow will do is is rush them back i think you know you think back to when q and trippia was missing you know they were 60 70 percent for that sunderland game you could Easily see Q and Trippier yeah, back in the starting eleven, but I think with Callum Wilson and Harvey Barnes, given the nature of their injuries, I think the last thing anyhow will do is, is rush them back. Even though you know Newcastle United definitely need them, but a word from the girl Almi on John because so much speculation about his future linked to a, a move to Saudi Arabia, um, and if he was looking on social media, he would have seen a ton of unnecessary abuse towards him. Um, you know, players celebrating the fact that he was going to move. And then, uh, sorry, fans celebrating the fact that he was going to move and then fans getting angry because uh, Miguel Miron didn't want to move to Saudi Arabia, which I totally applaud, a player not chasing the dollar and actually wanting to stay in a competitive league. That's brilliant to see. You know, it would have been very easy for him to go missing when he comes off the bench um, against Aston Villa, but he didn't. You know, within two, three minutes of him coming on, Ali McCoy is already praising him for 
his work rate and a, and, a, and a crucial interception and chasing down the ball. And then he gets the assist for the Jacob Murphy goal, a wonderful um, touch and cross into the box for Murphy to, to get the goal. Uh, a real solid performance from Miguel Almiron. It was really pleasing to see. And I think a real um, true showing of his character as well, that he didn't go hiding, that he just got on with it mm -hmm. and showed his worth. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think Miggy doesn't know how to hide. He doesn't know how to go missing. It's not in his nature. Um, you get what it says on the tin. You get 110% effort. You get blistering pace. You also sometimes get headless chicken and you know he, he's all the things that he is he is the most honest player in terms of what you see is what you get and I think he hasn't got it in him and I, you could, it's very easy to name players that have and I'm not thinking of particularly even the United players that can go missing I can think an awful lot in the Manchester United team that go missing at the moment and um, you know there's a, but I don't think that's in his makeup I, it never crossed my mind that, he, that there was a possibility, because it was him, of him doing that. And I think also he was so relieved to be staying, he wanted to go and show the owners and Eddie Howe how valuable he is to this club. I don't mean he's changed my opinion in 45 minutes of what I think should happen to Miggy Almiron in the future because that would be naive and that would be getting carried away. You know, when we've talked about all getting carried away by the Villa result, if we suddenly thought Almiron was Lionel Messi because of 45 minutes at, um, at Villa Park, we would be getting carried away. Miggy was Miggy. The good, the bad, and there's not much ugly, but the good, the bad, and the erratic, if you like. But he was, it, but he, he did the job. We knew he could do. When he come on, I was relieved he was there because I knew what we would get out of him, and it would be enough, as long as Gordon could do enough at centre forward. And if Almiron has to start on Saturday, uh, then my worry will not be, oh, will maybe be. Uh, give it his all or how will the fans take him or anything my concern will be can Anthony Gordon be potent enough at centre forward to for us to get the goals and I, that would be my worry more than Miggy would be my worry hmm. well there's a lot of talk given Miggy's performance that actually it's time for a bit of a run on the left hand side because he won't have to cut inside he can just actually you know yeah, take advantage sure. of the positions he finds himself so often on the right hand side, but he never takes advantage of because he has to cut inside and use his left. Um, I mean, the, the cross itself is a perfect example of why he does look more at home on the left wing. So maybe, I mean, I think we will see him on the left on, on Saturday and then it's going forward what happens. But a lot of people, John, have been very, very impressed. The Miguel Almiron fan club was inundated with applications following that 45 minute performance <laughs> from um, the away. I mean, we'll go from, um, I mean, isn't social media or whatever we want to call it, isn't it horrendous? I mean, before he goes to Villa Park, he's getting slaughtered because he won't get the hell out of the club so that we can buy somebody. And then after 45 minutes at Villa Park, he's almost Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo won in together. I would suggest the truth is somewhere down the middle of that, Look, you know, that um, it was very harsh to be, to want him thrown out of the club beforehand. And it's very harsh now to put him up there as a, a contender for player of the year on 45 minutes. And Miggy is Miggy is Miggy. And at the moment, is, is a, we need him very desperately. Uh, we know he won't let we down. Um, it's just what Every player, you know, at Newcastle United, there's a better player out there. And that's the way the entertainers were built. And that's the way Newcastle be built. There's an improvement. As Pope mm. was an improvement on the world there. There can be an improvement on Pope. It will happen and somebody will be better than Miggy. But for Miggy at the moment, pleased to see it. Because if he'd gone, there was no odds that we were going to get somebody in in time. I mean, that could have collapsed. And then we would be in a dreadful state, wouldn't we? Yeah, indeed. Would you, John, start? Um, would you would you start Miguel Almiron on on, on the left wing um, going forward, even if the injuries don't necessarily mean it has to happen? I would have no uh, complaints about that whatsoever. I would be quite happy and quite comfortable uh, to do that. Um, I mean, I think 
you would look at, at Almira and Gordon and say they're our first choice wingers. Um, you know, if you had a centre forward, if it was easy, uh, they are still our first choice wingers. Murphy, it's just you just think, can he get three games out of him in a week after the length of time he was out? I mean, he's done terrific. And I mean, to put in the time he's put in on the park at the level he has, uh, you know, it's quite phenomenal. I mean, he should be getting a lot of pats on the back as well because he come in after a, the shoulder trouble he had. And, you know, we had no right to think he could do much at all. And normally players take a little while to get up to, uh, to speed. And often Callum Wilson does. But, you know, Murphy put in a shift and a half at Fulham and a shift and a half again at Villa and, and good on him. And uh, I was also uh, going on about these three guys that play wide. I mean, I was really reassured by the performance of um, <coughs> Anthony Gordon. Because I thought he was back to his vibrant best. Yeah, definitely. Villa couldn't handle him. Um, and when we say nearly every week, John, but Gal Southgate, he's got to be looking at Gordon and, and thinking he's got to be in my England squad. I mean, I, I, think, right, but I couldn't do? care less. I mean, I wanted to happen for Gordon's sake, <clears throat> but as far as I'm concerned, with me and Castle United had on, if Southgate wants to stick with. Jordan Henderson, whether he's in Saudi or Ajax or wherever, and wants to stick with with Phillips, who's now on loan at West Ham, or and will not bring in people like Gordon. That's cover Southgate's problem, belt and braces, lad. Um, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I want England to do fabulous when it comes round, and I would like Gordon to get in for Gordon's sake. But with my Newcastle United hat on, I'm more concerned what happens to us between now and the end of the season, where we're finishing the league and can we win the cup, than worry about Southgate. Hmm. Wherever we do finish uh, in the league, hopefully top six, top seven, Gordon will have a huge role to play in that and good to see that he's got a bit of zip about him. You mentioned earlier on, John, about the change that Eddie Howe made (laughs) um, after Aston Villa scored uh, their only goal of the game. He brought... Livermento on for Lewis Miley after Leon Bailey came on and give Dan Byrne a really hard showing for about 10, 15 minutes. Then Villa got the goal and anyhow snapped into action, brought Livermento on to move Dan Byrne into the centre to play th- uh, five across the back and keep Bailey quiet. I mean, Bailey, to his credit, uh, he, he did actually really well. Livermento did better than Byrne. Um, but he's still got the beat, beat better in, in certain um, instances. But a, a really important move by Eddie Howe. Some saying it should have come a little bit earlier. Um, but I think the important thing is it, it, it came, it happened. Whereas maybe in the past, John, Eddie Howe maybe wouldn't have made that change and he would have yeah. just allowed Dan Byrne to suffer uh, for one of the best. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. It's it's wonderful to see something work and then say, well, it should have happened earlier. Uh, you, you know, hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, it's a wonderful thing. But, um, I mean, Dan Byrne <coughs> has played left back the way he plays left back, with a huge heart, with a clever brain, uh, with a total willingness, with a lack of pace, all those things. But he does a very good job because he also, when the ball's on the other side of the pitch, left wing, he can come in that little bit from his side of the pitch and be that extra third centre half with his height and and head all the balls out. And he can do that all day long. Uh, When you get absolute quality against him, a winger with good dancing feet is in trouble. A lot of genuine fullbacks are in trouble. But he's not a genuine fullback, he's a genuine centre half. So he is in trouble out there. He can get exposed. And Bailey was really taking them to the cleaners. And it was a very quick because it also, if they got a second goal, which they did, and it was choked off, we would have been in big trouble. So I had to snuff that out. And Lefamenko on was a perfect answer. I'm not saying it worked all the time. Nothing much works against Bailey because what a quality player he is. And um, but it worked. And um good that we did that and we needed to do that and um, you know this incidentally and i'm not going to bang on about it, it was little manko that come on and played on his wrong side it wasn't all who was supposed to be a left back worth worth 30 million and do you know when that change was made john that was the second thing that popped into my head was i can't wait to hear what john's got to say about the fact it's not lewis hall uh, but well, i thought 
Well, I mean, why are we going to buy? Why are we, if we don't play? I mean, I think Eddie could well be right. I am not having to go at Eddie for not playing him. I think Eddie's judgment could well be right. He sees him every day. But why, how the heck did we do a deal that can tot up the 30 million for a left back that can't get a sniff at left back? I don't know, John. I don't know. Um, maybe it'll become clear in, in the summer if indeed the Absolutely. deal goes, yeah. or doesn't go through. Um, I thought Dan Byrne actually had a had a, a really good first half in particular. Yeah. He kept yeah. Musa Diaby quiet. Diaby looks like a, a, a shadow of himself, really. You know, he's a top quality player. And Newcastle United liked him. A lot of fans wanted him signed in the summer. He went to Villa. But he just looks like a player bereft of confidence. But that being said, he's clearly a very talented player, lots of ability. And Dan Byrne he had looked, to get his he best. looked terrific on the on the opening day, if you remember, Andrew, at St. Yeah. James's Park. He got the equaliser and you, you looked at him and you thought, wow, this is a good player. This fella is a good player. No wonder we were interested in him. I don't know what's happened along the way, but um, yes, he didn't look that player last night, that's for certain. Dan Byrne kept him quiet, and uh, you know another did I think very decent performance from Dan Byrne until Bailey came on and got the better of him. But great to see Eddie Howe um, being you know uh, reactive to to the situation and 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 showing up the defence because that was a real key move to making sure Newcastle got a valuable three points. And it was funny, you know, when the team news came out, and, and, and listeners to the podcast know that this fixture means a little bit more in my household than, than most other fixtures because my father-in-law is an Aston Villa fan. So we're down actually, funny enough, at the in-laws and we were watching the game last night. The team news comes through and he says, I'm not sure why he's picked the RB. He should be playing Leon Bailey. And there's me thinking, then we knows what he's doing. Turns out my father-in-law was probably right. Um, but he wasn't very happy at the, the results in the end, which, um, you no. know, oh, no. well, oh, well. Um, but that's, I was very happy nice. with John. It is. Like, yeah. get, get used to it. We did for years in the old days. Exactly, and we had a we had a little daughter in our in our Newcastle United kit for the first time yesterday. Um, she was in bed. So she didn't get to see the rest of the didn't didn't get to see the game, but she wore it all day, um, and she looked very fetching in, in, in a black and white shirt. Well, so maybe by she's the end, by the end of the night, Villa were in bed and tucked up as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, they certainly were. Um, Luton then, John, you know. They beat uh, Brighton four 0 Which, if you, if anybody watching this podcast had that score written down, I don't believe you because there's not a chance that anyone had uh, Luton beating Brighton four 0 Andrew, Andrew, you're right. But tell me how many neutrals in this country had Aston Villa one, Newcastle three written down. That's very true. That is that is that is very true, John. Um, I mean, look, they're out with the relegation zone now. After that result, they they have, I think. What probably sets them apart, John, from the rest of the teams down there is probably their character and togetherness. You know, they know they haven't got the ability to stay up on ability alone. It needs something extra. It needs something a little bit special. You then throw in what happened to their captain, you know, best wishes to him. That's probably, you know, accelerated that togetherness. Um, and that's what's going to count. And like we mentioned before, if they've got more fight than Newcastle on Saturday, then you worry a little bit. But I'm I'm, I'm confident that what we saw against Villa, what we saw, um, you know, the fight that came out against City, against Fulham to a degree, it'll be there on Saturday. And really, this is a game Newcastle United ought to be winning. Oh, there's no question about that. I mean, if you look at Luton's, yes, the one at Everton in the cup, last minute, last minute goal, they beat Brighton four. Eye opener, but Brighton's got that in them, you know. I mean, when we were playing Brighton last season, I was having a look because to make certain my memory wasn't playing tricks, and it wasn't. They'd beaten Wolves six, they'd beaten Manchester United one nil, then had everything at home. This is Brighton, and they lost five one. Then they went to Arsenal, who were going for the title and won three nil. Then they come up here when they lost four one up here. So they lost 5 1 to Everton and 4 1 to us while being this wonderfully attractive side. They've done all this wonderfully attractive stuff. And by the way, when they implode in its one its one off matches, they implode big time. They imploded at home 5 1 to Everton, they imploded to us 4 1, they imploded to, to Luton 4 0. I mean, they do it big time. It happens. But Luton's away record is two wins, two draws, and six defeats. We've won. We've won eight of eleven at home in the Premier League. If we are, if we meet them, as you say, 
attitude for attitude, we win. And um, I believe, especially after what happened at Kenilworth Road, when we got muscled a little bit and we got a very bad result, 1-0, and that will be smarting within the players. And you don't think Eddie Howe will be mentioning that every hour that passes between now and Saturday. Hey, remember what they did to us. They're not going to be allowed to do it again. And um, no, I believe we'll win. Yeah, you'll just need to be printing off loads of pictures of Ross Barkley's smiling face and sticking it around the dressing room and saying, remember this guy, you made a mockery of you lot. Um, back in December. But like I say, I think there's enough uh, pieces of the jigsaw clicking together that Newcastle United should pick up all three points. Of course, that we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. It's, it's you know, one win. It's one fantastic performance, but it only really matters if Newcastle can build on it. They've got to do that against Luton and then the games to come. Uh, but fingers crossed, they can do. John, how is it going to go on Saturday? Oh, Newcastle's going to win because they'll match them on will. They'll match them on will and then they'll outdo them on ability. Because man for man, Barkley's the worry. You're absolutely right. They've got two worries. Barkley boss in the middle of the park, which he did at Kenilworth Road. But I was reassured a bit by our midfield performance down at Villa. We've got Barkley in the middle of the park and they've got to watch that these big lads on set pieces don't run off their shoulder because that's where they get most of their goals from. Uh, but man for man, even with all the injuries we've got, we've got more quality in them. I will be worried about not having Isaac if we, if we don't have Isaac, especially if we also don't have Callum Wilson in the starting lineup. I will be worried there because I'll be thinking where the goal's going to come from. Uh, that is a concern because we don't want to dominate the match and it's not, no, that's no good to us at all. Um, but no, I'm quite confident. Scoreline, who cares? If if Isaac plays, it's 2-0 or it's 3-0. If Isaac doesn't play, I'll take 1-0. You still get three points. Um, but I am confident with or without our main strike force, we will win. Yeah, I'm going to go for Newcastle United win. I'm just I'm hoping Sean Longstaff scores. I know he scored against Fulham, but he could have had a a goal against, he should have had a goal against Villa. So I'm hoping he can get on the score sheet and start a goal scoring bit of form. But yeah, I'm going to go for a Newcastle win over Luton and they can continue their rise up the table. Before I let you go, John, I just want to get your words on Jurgen Klopp resigning, quitting yeah. Liverpool. Um, yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I was getting sick to death of Jurgen Klopp and I was getting sick to death of them beating us, which they do all the time. I was getting sick to death of the way they did it on Isaac's debut at Anfield and the way they did it up here, 11 men against 10 with two late goals uh, and seeing them on the touchline with that um, big smile of pearly white Hollywood's teeth. But having said all that, once the announcement came that he was going, I thought, I've got to doff my cap to you because you've gone to Liverpool and you've won everything. He's won the European Cup, he's won the Premier League, he's won the Super Cup, he's won the World Club Championship. He's won everything bar the raffle. Um, and at a time where there's a dominance of Man City you've got, um, that is quite something. Um, I loved him when he first came. I slowly got to dislike him a little bit more and a little bit more as time went on, especially the way where he suffered in his hand and unjustifiably suffered. And then the mornings that we got from time to time, but I've got to say that he has absolutely put the dignity back into that club and won them things when they, they'd forgotten how to win the, the Premier League title. Uh, so you've got to say, well done, a terrific servant, done wonderfully well, and I'm well chuffed to see him go because it might give us a bit more wiggle room to get into that top and scatter a few feathers in a few clubs next season. Liverpool without Jurgen Klopp, Suits me fine next season while well, in Liverpool with you in the club. Mm, could definitely turn into a my United scenario after Sir Alex Ferguson. And, and yes, you're right, you know, Klopp's a, a more my character, but if he's your pot of more might, you'd be spreading Correct. that on your post every morning, wouldn't you? And what we have to hope, John, is maybe Newcastle can get Liverpool in the FA Cup final in May and finally Eddie Howe can get one over Jurgen Klopp. Wouldn't that be the perfect way 
for Klopp to end his Liverpool career? Oh, I mean, that would be absolutely wonderful. But you know what? When you're an old so-and-so like me and you've got a long memory and you've seen everything, you know what would concern me there, Andrew? And you won't know this because you're a young whippersnapper, is that when I watched Supermark play centre forward for Newcastle against Liverpool in 1974 FA Cup final, you know what happened? It was Shankly's last game as manager of Liverpool and the slaughterers. And it's Klopp's last game as manager of Liverpool. You get the end of that sentence. Yeah, we don't want history repeating it. No, we don't. <laughs> um, John, thank you as said, always. It's said that Klopp's the best manager Liverpool's had since Shankly. So that yeah. would be an awful end to the, to the season as well. It would, it would. Um, John, thank you as always for popping on to everything is Black and White Podcast. To you guys watching and listening, hit follow, hit subscribe through whichever platform you join us on. If you are on YouTube, give this video a thumbs up. If you're on a podcast channel, please leave us a rating and a review. Do it right now, please. It helps us get the uh, show out to a wider audience. It costs nothing to do. It just helps us out immensely. And we're always very grateful to hear your feedback. For myself and John, we'll see you guys very soon.